Hello, Bio245. This is Vanessa again, and we're going to continue on with week 10 of your practical term sheet 3 list. Um, so very first thing on here, you'll see it says pulse and physiology, and it says no ion concentrations and steps involved during resting membrane potential depolarization and repolarization of action poten cardiac action potential. So what I'm going to show you today is an action potential. I'm going to show you um, the repolarization, depolarization the electrical trace that you would normally see. And I am going to show you pictures that I drew of a heart. And let's see this one. Let's closer. Okay. So first off, let's talk about um, the cardiac muscle action potential because as you guys know, what makes a muscle cell contract and release get that release of calcium going is an action potential just like in a neuron. Okay. So the same kinds of things happen, it's just a little bit different. So first thing you'll notice is that it doesn't look like a typical neuron action potential because a normal, action, normal neuron action potential kind of looks like one of these and it goes down and then it kind of levels out again, right? Or at least I'm pretty sure this is what you guys covered in lecture. So you can see that there's something a little bit different going on here, but still don't worry, the same kind of stuff is involved. And as far as ions, for the purpose of this lab, we're not going to go super crazy. What I want you to know about are the relative concentrations of sodium and calcium, because those are the big players. Um, you'll, you'll learn more about chloride and potassium and all that stuff in lecture, so we're not going to talk too much about it here. But the big players are going to be sodium and calcium. Sodium is going to be responsible for the upstroke, which we'll talk about. Calcium is going to be responsible for um, this kind of plateau here that we'll talk about in a second, and both of them leaving the cell accounting for this deep this repolarization of the cell okay so first we have this upstroke thing going on right so in this case sodium is rushing into the cell so this causes the inside of the cell to become more positive which is shown as this large upstroke exactly like in the neuron which the same thing happens right we have that sodium flooding the cell and that results in a more positive uh, inside of your cell because there's more positive ions and so you get this upstroke, right? And then what we have is around here, we also start to have calcium coming in, okay? Calcium starts to be a big player here. After about this point, sodium starts leaving the cell, just like in the neuron, because we don't want our cell to be excited for forever, that's not healthy. So in the case of the neuron, we pump that sodium back out, life is good. Here though, we are pumping out sodium, it's leaving, but calcium is leaving a little more slowly. So in this case, this still, that the fact that it's still positive here, this is actually because there's still calcium hanging around. Calcium, as you guys probably know, just based on the symbol for the ion, it has two positive charges. So putting calcium in your cell is also gonna make it positive. So this plateau here, we have lots of calcium. Then we have this downstroke. So this represents both calcium and sodium leaving the cell or being actively pumped out of the cell. Okay? Or in the case of calcium, we can re-sequester it or put it away in our sarcoplasmic reticulum, just like in, we have in the uh, skeletal muscle. So we can put away that calcium or pump it out of the cell because too much calcium is very toxic for the inside of the cell. Okay? And then we have a point here where we actually get more negative than the normal resting potential. Um, and we don't need to know about the ions, uh, that, they, not a gate. Anyway, the ions are responsible for that, okay? But anyway, that's the basic layout of our action potential. So if I want to ask you a question on the practical or on a quiz, I'm, what I'm going to ask you about is the relative concentration of ions. And when I say relative concentration, what I mean is, is it high or is it low, okay? So down here, for example, below this dotted line, sodium is low. Calcium is low. Okay. If I ask you here, obviously sodium is high. And ask you here, obviously calcium is high. Here, like sodium is less high, but ca calcium is pretty high here, and sodium is its highest point there. Okay. So all I really want you to know is just relative levels of these ions. Now, when it's talking in that list about knowing the, them and resting membrane potential and depolarization and repolarization, um, basically for depolarization, you guys already know, depolarization is the active potential part. It becomes more positive, right? Repolarization is where it's becoming more negative again, okay? Coming back to a rest. This looks a little bit different when you look at the entire heart. So, um, there. 
So we're going to leave our cell at that point. So I'm going to erase this because I have a lot of stuff going on on the board and I don't want it to get confusing. All right. So we'll talk about stuff with the heart like repolarization right now. So first off on your list, you have something called heart sounds. So heart sounds, um, usually what you're actually listening for is, yes, you're listening for blood flow, but you're listening for valve functionality. And if you guys recall, when we learned about valves, there's two different types. So here's just a big drawing of a heart. And again, you don't got to get fancy about it. This is just a standard heart. You have your septums in between, and then you have your chambers. So you have your right atria, or atrium rather, left atrium. I'm just writing this quickly so it's not pretty, but right ventricle and your left ventricle. Okay, so there you go. And like I said, you have these two valve types, right? You have one that connects your atria to your ventricle, those AV or atrioventricular valves or AV valves, right? And then you have another kind that exits the ventricle and enters into an artery. So these guys that look like little peace signs semi-lunars, right? So this is just a really simplistic drawing of the heart, but still the same principle applies. We have some kind of vein entering blood. It goes, fills the atrium. The atrium squishes. Blood goes down into the ventricle. Then the ventricle squishes. And then blood leaves via that semi-lunar valve and exits out of some kind of artery, right? Goes out into the world, whether the lungs, in this case, on the right side, the lungs, right? And then it's going to return, right, via some veins. Boom, fills up the atrium. The atrium is going to squish, fill the ventricle. The ventricle is going to squish. That blood's going to leave via that semilunar valve. And then we got that big old aorta so the blood can go out to the heart. So, anyway, that's just my simplistic drawing here. So, just to remind us that we have these valves, and these valves are very important. These valves open and they close. Um, it's really important that they do close and that they close properly because that's going to allow for the ultimate pressure in that chamber. So, for example, when that atrium squishes, it's going to open up those AV valves so that blood can go straight down. And then when the ventricle squishes, the AV valve actually closes. Okay. This is important because this produces maximum pressure inside of the ventricle so it can send blood wherever, right? In the case of the left ventricle out to the body, in the case of the right ventricle out to the lungs. So the AV valve here actually closes to allow for maximum pressure buildup. And then our semilunar valve opens. Okay. So when you're listening to the heart, what you're really listening for, yes, you're listening, to, like I said, to that flow of the blood, but you're listening for these valves. The closing of these valves makes a sound, okay? So whenever your, your doctor is listening to all those different places on your chest, your doctor is listening for valve functionality. So here is my little drawing of what we can see. I'm going to move this up a little bit closer, so hopefully it's a little less fuzzy. There, okay. So... First off, I have a heart here where we see all the valves are closed. So we have just a straight line across, across our AV valves are closed, and our semilunar valves are closed as well. Next, we have the atria squishing. They're both squishing blood down into the ventricles, and you can see here that I have them open. Okay, So AV valves, they're open. Next, we have the AV valves close. Now when those AV valves close, if you look at a picture of a heart or you look at the heart model, you'll see that the AV valves are kind of flaps and they hang down into the ventricle. So when the AV valves are closed, they're like this, and then when they open, they're like little flaps that go out like this. They're actually like a really soft semi uh structure. So when they close, they go like floop, and they make this sound lub. So they go floop, and that's lub. That is called an S1 sound. So that's one of the sounds that your doctor is listening for. And like I said, that AV valve closes to maintain pressure inside the ventricle so that blood doesn't go back the other way, because that's no bueno. And we see here that the semilunar valve opens. So you can see that it's this open hole, right? So blood's going out. Then our ventricle relaxes again, so our semilunar valve closes. Um, and if you do it a heart dissection or you see the pictures, you'll see that a semilunar valve uh, flap is a very hard kind of piece of cartilage. And so when it closes, it's not like a nice soft flap like the AV valve where it goes floop. When the semilunar valve closes, it makes a snap kind of sound. So that's going to be dub. So it, when it snaps, when it closes, it goes dub. Makes a really uh, sharp sound. 
and that's called an S2. So you have S1s and you have S2s corresponding to lub, which is your AV, dub, which is your semilinear. So those are your S1, S1, or S1 and S2 sounds. Okay. When the heart is beating, you'll notice that the next term on your list is your heart rate. Um, your heart rate is really important for maintaining proper arterial pressure throughout the body, which is very important because you don't want blood pooling in places if it's too slow or um, not spending enough time and dropping off oxygen as needed if it's too fast. Anyway, uh, could, and it can increase your blood pressure, which is bad. But normal heart rate is going to be about 60 beats per minute. It's going to vary from individual to individual. Um, really tall people tend to have a slightly little slower, and maybe, some, I don't know if shorter people have faster, but definitely tall people can tend to have sometimes slower than 60 beats per minute. But 60 beats per minute is viewed as the average heart rate. Um, you'll notice that the next terms are bradycardia and tachycardia. So bradycardia is going to be an abnormally slow heart rate. Um, this can happen if you have like a boost in your blood pressure. To try and decrease that pressure, your heart will actually slow down. Or when you're asleep, you, your heart slows down as well. But bradycardia can be a sign of something really serious going on, um, either with the heart or with blood pressure. Tachycardia is faster than normal blood, blood or heart rate, excuse me, faster than normal heart rate. Um, this can happen if you have a drop in blood pressure. So your heart tries to make the fluid go a little bit faster, so fill up those arteries a little bit more so that it will increase your arterial pressure. Um, so tachycardia can be indicative of low blood pressure or something else going on. It could be indicative, indicative of blood loss because when you lose a lot of blood, that decreases the pressure in your arteries and your heart, again, will beat faster to compensate for that. So bradycardia and tachycardia are important things to look for, so it's important to know your average heart rate, which is about 60 beats per minute. Next, we have valvular insufficiency or heart murmur. So remember how I was talking before how it's super important that when these AV valves open and then they close again and they make that S1 sound that they close all the way and they have those little cords of tendine that keep the valves attached to the ventricular walls so that way they don't invert. If you have blood going backwards, like let's just say your AV valves did invert and you have a little bit of blood going backwards from when the ventricle is squishing and pushing blood out, right? So let's just say it does go back up into the atrium. You can hear a sound associated with that when you hear your valves closing and it sounds like a little like like a little murmur. So that's what that valvular insufficiency or heart murmur is. It's blood going the wrong way, typically. Valvular stenosis on your list. Valvular stenosis is a hardening or effusing of the valves so that they don't really open quite as easily. So in this case, that would be like our semilunar valves maybe being more difficult to open, which is going to put less blood onto the vasculature, which can decrease blood pressure, which is bad, and then you can boost your heart rate. That's bad because then you can get a thicker muscle wall because just like any muscle, if you work out, that muscle gets thicker. So if your heart is beating faster or stronger, that can make the wall really beefy, which is bad because then you don't have as much room to put blood into the ventricle, right? That's no bueno. So um, you don't want either valvular insufficiency or valvular stenosis. Those are both bad days. Next, we have pulse palpation. Pulse palpation is just feeling for a pulse, and we actually have all these pulse points that we want you to know, and I will show you in a moment. But pulse palpation is what you normally see, like, on a lot of TV shows, of like, is that person dead? And then they put their fingers along the person's neck. They're palpating for a pulse. A pulse is just basically a fluctuation of the artery, specifically, as blood fills it. So the ventricle squishes, and it squishes rhythmically, obviously. And as it squishes, arteries kind of flex open and fill with fluid. So that's what you're feeling when you feel for your pulse. Now for the pulse points. And here is our friend, the valve guy. Okay? So um, I'm going to point out all the pulse points on him. So first off, um, a lot of these are going to be named, well, all of these are named after arteries. So as you learn the arteries next week, then you'll know your pulse points a little bit better. Or vice versa, you can learn your pulse points now and you'll know your arteries better next week. So first off, we have our temporal, our superficial temporal pulse. And you're going to feel that on, along the temporal bone. So right about there is where you're going to feel it. Okay, you know when people get real mad and they have that big vessel standing out in their head, that's what I think of for the temporal pulse. Next is your common carotid pulse. Your common carotid pulse, you're going to feel for along the neck. So that's the one that people feel for on TV shows when they want to know if somebody's alive or not. Next is the brachial pulse. The brachial pulse, you feel right here. Okay, so right inside of the elbow is where you're going to feel for the brachial pulse. Because that's the brachial artery and that's right before it splits along the bones. So that's going to be where you feel for your brachial pulse. Next, we have 
Next, it says for moral, but we're going to do radial next. Radial pulse is next. So again, here's that brachial artery. It splits, and along the radial bone, or the radius bone, we have the radial artery. So when you're feeling for the radial pulse, you're feeling it along the radius, but in particular, right about, right about there, okay? Right around there. I can feel mine right there. All right, so yeah, you feel right along your radius about near the hand, so on your wrist. So when people feel the pulse in their wrist, they're typically feeling for the radial pulse. Next is the popliteal. So you guys know that the popliteal region is behind your knee. So in this case, we can see that there's this big old artery. Oh, this is the femoral artery. I'll go back to the femoral pulse in a second. But the popliteal artery, you'll feel behind your knee. So you can see that there, there's a vessel that passes behind your knee there. For the femoral pulse, you actually feel that kind of on the inside of the crease where your thigh attaches to your torso. So what you're feeling is right about there, all right? And that's where the artery is very large and superficial. So um, if you get an injury to your femoral artery, like that can happen really easily in this superficial place. You guys will see that on your muscle men models too. If you look, you can see the iliopsoas muscle on one side and you can see the adductor longus on the other side and in between is a big vasculature. Very superficial, very easy to feel the pulse right there. Okay. Okay, and then like I already said, we had the popliteal. Next is the posterior tibial pulse. So the posterior tibial pulse, as you could imagine, it's on the back side of the tibia, the posterior side. And you're gonna feel for that right about here. Okay, so you guys know you have that big tendon in the back of your ankle, so you feel kind of just anterior to that tendon. And you'll, if you pinch there, you'll feel your pulse. Last for your pulse points is the dorsalis pedis. So uh, if you guys know about your foot, obviously for your for your foot region um, is that's the pes p e s, but it's also called the pedal region p e d a l, like pedaling a bike. So pedis is foot. In other words, p e d pedis is foot. Dorsalis comes from the dorsal side of the foot because there's the dorsal side of the foot, which is the top. Oh, sorry, you can't actually see there. The dorsal side of the foot is the top of the foot. Plantar side of the foot is the bottom of the foot. So what the dorsalis pedis is on the dorsal side of your foot. Okay, and you're gonna feel for that pulse right about there, where I have my fingers. So like kind of where your your the top of your ankle is. So that's gonna be your dorsalis pedis pulse. Okay. And why do you use your two fingers and not your thumb? Um, you should use these two fingers, definitely not your thumb, because your thumb doesn't have as much insensi sensitivity, from what I understand. It doesn't have as much sensitivity as these guys do. Isn't there also a pulse in your thumb? I don't know. I guess there might be a pulse in your thumb, too. So, moving on, let's go back to some more heart fizz stuff. Um, so, there's only a few more terms left, but they're a little bit weird, so I'm going to describe them as best as I can. So, um, next on your list, we have blood pressure. So I'm going to talk to you, you have to know about the different kinds of pressures and you kind of have to know, at least it helps a little bit to know how you measure them. So you can see I have this beautiful drawing here, and silent, sound silent, and spin and all this crazy stuff. So what we're measuring when we're measuring blood pressure is, I'll just describe the process and then I'll describe more of the definition. So you guys might be familiar with getting your blood pressure taken, you go to the doctor or a nurse's office or whatever, and they put on that cuff on your arm, right? So in this case, that's going to be our swig mominometer, which is on your list, and you got to know how to spell it. <laughs> so break it down however you need to, but it is coming from the word sphygmos for pressure and then monometer, which is just a way to measure stuff, okay? Anyway, so they put the cuff on, right? And it, they increase the pressure on the cuff. What they're doing is they're squishing the artery in your arm, in this case, the brachial artery, okay? So they're squishing, squishing, squishing that artery. So first, your artery is open, completely open and filled with blood. Then they squish that artery for a while, and eventually they're gonna completely close it. So the whole purpose of this is what, or at least what they're listening for, is when you, uh, when, when they release that pressure rather, so in other words, they, they're squishing, 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 squishing until that artery is completely closed, and then they release that pressure, and eventually that artery will start to open again, and you know that they're sitting there listening with their stethoscope, right? So what they're listening for is whenever your vessel is completely open, it is silent, it doesn't make any sound. When the vessel is kind of pinched, it makes a, like a, a whirring kind of sound, like a gurgling sound. And when it's completely closed, it's silent. So what you might liken this to is like a, if you listen to your garden hose, if you hold it up to your, to your ear and it's completely open, you won't really hear anything. But if you start to pinch it, you can actually start to hear that gurgling sound. And if it's completely closed, it's silent. Okay. So 
sphygmomanometer closes off your artery, it's silent. So what they're listening for is as they decrease that pressure, that artery starts to open, okay? And as soon as it starts to open, they can hear that in their stethoscope. This is, the, and then you'll notice that as they're, you know, listening to the sounds of your artery, they're also staring at the pressure gauge on the sphygmomanometer. So the first number that they're going to write down is when they start to hear that sound as they're releasing the pressure. This is called the systolic pressure. So this is when the artery starts to fill. Um, the other way I think about it is like the blood is starting to squeeze through. So I always think like S systolic, that blood is squeezing through. And they're going to keep listening and slowly, slowly, slowly letting off the pressure. And then at some point, your artery is going to be silent. Okay, so it's completely open now. When it's completely open, they're going to write down the number that that pressure on the cuff is. In this case, that's going to be your diastolic pressure. So when your artery becomes completely open, that is the second number they write down. That's your diastolic pressure. So first number is when they first start to hear that sound, when the blood overcomes that uh, squishing of the artery, when it has enough pressure behind it to squish through. And then the diastolic is just when it's completely full. Um, that's why the top number is higher than the second number, because they're decreasing the pressure. That's the first sound that they hear, and then that's the second sound that they hear, okay? Or the second thing that they hear. So anyway, typical blood pressure is 120 over 80, and you'll see different estimates of average, but everybody's a little bit different, right? But 120 over 80 is just the agreed upon average. And you'll notice here the units of measurement these are millimeters of mercury, so MMHG. If you guys have taken a basic chemistry course, then you should know that HG is the atomic symbol for mercury. Okay? Millimeters is referring to uh, the actual tube that they use to measure pressure. It, you'll see that it's like a tube. Oh, geez, you can't see that. When you measure pressure, there's a tube, and it is filled with mercury, and it's just measured in the side um, with 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 actual just millimeters, okay? So as pressure increases, the tube of mercury moves higher. If it's low, then it's lower. So millimeters of mercury, that is the uh, units of measurement. And you guys have to know that, okay? Okay, last thing I gotta tell you about is uh, in looking at a cardiogram, an electrocardiogram. So I'm going to just move this over one more time. So I'll show you guys this. So, uh, whenever you want to look at the electronics of your heart, because we were talked about looking at individual cells, and that's what we were looking at with the cardiac uh, action potential, but if you want to look at the overall heart muscle and like how it's performing, you're going to do one of these, an ECG or EKG if you're in other places. And what these different waves are representing is the contraction of the actual muscle of the heart. So whenever the muscle is doing something, whenever the charge of the muscle is changing, it is represented by these bumps in the graph, okay? So you probably might have heard that we have this P wave, this QRS complex, and then the T wave. And I'll tell you about what they represent. And I actually have little drawings here to represent on the bottom, okay? So first off, we have the P wave. So the P wave represents depolarization of the atria. What does that mean? That means that each of those little cardiac muscle cells are depolarized action potential, right? So the electronics of the heart change. So your atria are squishing. That corresponds with an electrical change, and that's going to be the P wave. Okay, so atria squishing or depolarizing, that's a P wave. Next, we have the QRS complex. Um, you can notice it's a much bigger spike of activity. There's actually two rounds of activity occurring inside of this complex. First off, we have depolarization of the ventricles. Ventricles are beefier muscles because they're going to be sending it out a heck of a lot farther. Atrium only has to send it down below, right? They just go squish and life is done. But for the ventricles, they have to overcome a lot of arterial pressure and it's going out into the body or into the lungs. So you have a big spike of electrical change whenever that ventricle contracts or depolarizes. The cells in that muscle depolarize. The other thing that's happening is that the atria repolarize, so they relax, right? That repolarization of the cell, it becomes more negative again, right? So uh, repolarization of the atria, depolarization of your ventricles. That's the QRS complex. Lastly, we have the T wave. So the T wave is just representing the ventricles relaxing again. So the ventricles become repolarized. The cardiac cells of the ventricles are becoming repolarized, so in other words, they're becoming more negative again and going back to resting. Okay, 
So that's what all of these represent, just electrical changes in the heart. Um, and uh, you can also think about these as representing just contraction overall rather than depolarization, repolarization. But repolarization, depolarization are the words that we would like you to know. And again, depolarization is going to correspond with contraction. Repolarization is going to correspond with relaxation. Okay? And blood filling that area. So anyway, so that those are all the terms that we want you to know. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time.